Hello and welcome. Welcome along, everyone, to more uh, Victorian ghost stories with me, your host, Luke. Hello, everyone in the chat. It is great to see you all uh, reporting in. Let's read a few comments. Antonio Lau says, turn the lights off and got me a mug of hot chocolate. So I'm so ready. Uh, Alex Samara says, this music is great, by the way. Uh, yeah, that's the stream starting soon music. It's good, right? It's cool. Um, hello everyone who came over from Ellen's stream. Uh, I was watching, um, Ellen do Q&A, or at least I was watching the, uh, um, I was watching it as I was fussing around with microphones and green screens and stuff. Um, hello, hello everyone. Castle94 says toot. Uh, Mara del, uh, Mara del Val says hi from Mexico. Hello Mexico. Wow. Gosh. Um, hello from California says Maddie Lyle. Right, well, thank you everyone for reporting in, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, if this is your first time, um, then uh, we're going to do exactly what the headline suggests, which is read a spooky old ghost story from the olden times. Um, today we're going to read um, a story uh, by the author uh, M.R. James. It is a short story called The Ash Tree. I have read it already. Um, last week... Um, I saw, I read a story that I hadn't read yet. Um, this time, just so, just to make it a little easier on me to read, uh, I have read it before. Um, but that means I can tell you that you are in for a treat. I'll tell you a little bit about the author, M.R. James, uh, born 1862 and died 1936. Um, an English medievalist scholar who is best remembered, uh, today for his ghost stories. Um, which all have a, a sort of common setting and vibe to them, but are really, really creepy. Um, we are going to be reading today from um, Ghost Stories um, of an Antiquary, which um, is maybe one of... It's a, it's a compilation of short stories, of which The Ash Tree is one. Um Yes, it was published in 1904, which means technically, I think this isn't really uh, Victorian fiction because I think it, it was just after, um, I believe, just after uh, the end of the Victorian period. But it is very, very much uh, um, uh, of that uh, of that ilk of that of that genre. So I think we can get away with it. I think I I, I think I'm going to allow it, um, basically. Um, yeah. So. Um, we will crack on without too much ado, um, and uh, and yeah, see how we go, and and hopefully, hopefully you all enjoy. Let me check in once more with the chat, and then we'll begin. Um, Shy Violet says no fancy scarf on the chair today. Oh no, I forgot my fancy scarf. Oh, that's all right. We'll have it back on for next time. And uh, Kelsey Schoenbaum says, Victoria died in 1901, I think. Um, yep, that's what I had as well. Which, yeah, means that we are slightly out. But you know what? Like, it's it's close enough for jazz, right? Um, it's close enough. Um, Sebastian Hearn Gerard says, hello, Luke. Hello. Tom Titherington says, Luke the friendly vampire. That's me. That's me. Mostly friendly. Mostly harmless. Uh, Swooping is bad. Says, got my blanket and hot chocolate and everything. Phil Tyler says, I'm getting some fancy vibes from the infamous ash trees of old. Oh, yeah. OK, right. This is a good one. And I'm excited to read it. I've been excited all week uh, to read this one. So um, 
here we go. Uh, I will begin with a, a small disclaimer that probably should apply to all, um, uh, you know, fiction of this era, which is that we're reading a ghost story, but as usual, the real fright uh, are the um, Victorian attitudes to things like uh, women, class, colonialism, race, nationality. Um, so, you know, there's there's a disclaimer that these stories are are old and um and and have um outmoded attitudes in them occasionally um so there you go there is there is that disclaimer all right let's begin with the ash tree um i will take little breaks uh occasionally um at points that feel appropriate so we can check in with the chat see what everyone's thinking of the story see what everyone's enjoy if everyone's enjoying it Aisha says yay listening to this i played breath of the wild on my switch purchased after watching your playthroughs that's really flattering enjoy breath of the wild that's awesome um uh cool okay here we go the ash tree <clears throat> let me take a sip of water and i'll begin The Ash Tree. Everyone who has travelled over eastern England knows the smaller country houses with which it is studded. The rather dank little buildings, usually in the Italian style, surrounded with parks of some 80 to 100 acres. For me they have always had a very strong attraction, with the grey paling of split oak, the noble trees, the mirrors with their reed beds and the line of distant woods. Then I like the pillared portico, perhaps stuck onto a red brick Queen Anne house which has been faced with stucco to bring it in line with the Grecian taste of the end of the 18th century. The hall inside going up to the roof, which hall ought to be provided with a gallery and a small organ. I like the library too, where you may find anything from a Psalter of the 13th century to a Shakespeare quarto. I like the pictures, of course, and perhaps most of all, I like fancying what life in such a house was when it was first built, and in the piping times of landlord's prosperity. And not least now, when, if money is not so plentiful, taste is more varied and life quite as interesting. I wish to have one of these houses, and enough money to keep it together and entertain my friends in it modestly. But this is a digression. I have to tell you of a curious series of events which happened in such a house as I have tried to describe. It is Castringham Hall in Suffolk. I think a good deal has been done to the building since the period of my story, but the essential features I have sketched are still there. Italian portico, square block of white house, older inside than out, park with fringe of woods and mere. The one feature that marked out the house from a score of others is gone. As you looked at it from the park, you saw on the right a great old ash tree growing within half a dozen yards of the wall, and almost or quite touching the building with its branches. I suppose it had stood there ever since Castringham ceased to be a fortified place, and since the moat was filled in and the Elizabethan dwelling house built. At any rate, it had well nigh attained its full dimensions in the year 1690. In that year, the district in which the hall is situated was the scene of a number of witch trials. It will be long, I think, before we arrive at a just estimate of the amount of solid reason, if there was any, which lay at the root of the universal fear of witches in old times. Whether the persons accused of this offence really did imagine that they were possessed of unusual power of any kind, or whether they had the will, at least, if not the power, of doing mischief to their neighbours, or whether all the confessions, of which there are so many, were extorted by the cruelty of the witch-finders. These are questions which are not, I fancy, yet solved, and the, president, and the present narrative gives me pause. I cannot altogether sweep it away as mere invention. The reader must judge for himself. Castringham contributed a victim to the auto da fe. Mrs. Mothersole was her name, and she differed from the ordinary run of village witches only in being rather better off and in a more influential position. Efforts were made to save her by several reputable farmers of the parish. They did their best to testify to her character, and showed considerable anxiety as to the verdict of the jury. But what seems to have been fatal to the woman was the evidence of the then proprietor of Castringham Hall, Sir Matthew Fell. He deposed to having watched her on three different occasions from his window, at the full of the moon, gathering sprigs from the ash tree near my house. She had climbed into the branches, clad only in her shift, 
and was cutting off small twigs with a peculiarly, peculiarly curved knife. And as she did so, she seemed to be talking to herself. On each occasion, Sir Matthew had done his best to capture the woman, but she had always taken alarm at some accidental noise he had made, and all he could see when he got down to the garden was a hare running across the path in the direction of the village. On the third night, he had been at the pains to follow at his best speed, and had gone straight to Mrs. Mothersole's house, but he had had to wait a quarter of an hour battering at her door, and then she had come out very cross and apparently very sleepy, as if just out of bed, and he had no good explanation to offer of his visit. Mainly on this evidence, though there was much more of a less striking and unusual kind from other parishioners, Mrs. Mothersole was found guilty and condemned to die. She was hanged a week after the trial, with five or six more unhappy creatures at Bury St. Edmunds. Sir Matthew Fell, then Deputy Sheriff, was present at the execution. It was a damp, drizzly March morning when the cart made its way up the rough grass hill outside Northgate, where the gallows stood. The other victims were apathetic or broken down with misery, but Mrs. Mothersole was, as in life, so in death, of a very different temper. Her poisonous rage, as a reporter of the time puts it, did so work upon the bystanders, yes, even the hangman, that it was constantly affirmed of all that saw her that she presented the living aspect of a mad devil. Yet she offered no resistance to the officers of the law, only she looked upon those that laid hands upon her with so direful and venomous an aspect that, as one of them afterwards assured me, the mere thought of it preyed inwardly upon his mind for six months after. However, all that she is reported to have said were the seemingly meaningless words, there will be guests at the hall, which she repeated more than once in an undertone. Sir Matthew Fell was not unimpressed by the bearing of the woman. He had some talk upon the matter with the vicar of his parish, with whom he travelled home after the assize business was over. His, ev his evidence at the trial had not been very willingly given. He was not specially infected with the witch-finding mania, but he declared then and afterwards that he could not give any other account of the matter than that he had given, and that he could not possibly have been mistaken as to what he saw. The whole transaction had been repugnant to him, for he was a man who liked to be on pleasant terms with those about him. But he saw a duty to be done in this business, and he had done it. That seems to have been the gist of his sentiments, and the vicar applauded it, as any reasonable man must have done. Let's take a little break there and... Uh, Check in, consolidate what we have. So, Sir Matthew Fell gave evidence in a witch trial, claimed that this Mrs. Mothersole was, uh, um, what did he claim? What did he claim she was doing? Gathering sprigs from the ash tree, climbing into the branches and cutting off twigs. And when he tried to catch her, just saw a hare running across the, uh, across the garden. I really enjoy the note here. Um, um, <laughs> I really enjoy the note that he wasn't, you know, especially infected with the witch-finding mania, but uh, obviously he considered it his duty uh, to give evidence and um, uh, and get this woman put to death. So what are we thinking so far? Let me know in the chat. Um, Hunt and D says, watching with my wife Jane as a birthday treat for her as she writes an exam today. Thanks for doing these. Uh, you're very welcome. Danny McNamara says, full of the moon, it's a werewolf. The voice of Todd says, this already sounds creepy. <laughs> Shy Violet says, so take notes, don't garden in the Victorian era. Nimble Tack says, read this story many times, never fails to creep me out. So Nimble Tack knows what's coming. Interesting. Gentleman Drill says, OK, I don't know the story, but it is really interesting so far. By the way, I'm such a big fan of these streams. Thank you, Gentleman Drill. And Aim B says, convicted for unlawful shrubberying. There you go. There you go. Well, something tells me that is not the end of Mrs. Mother Soul's um, contribution to the story. Canned Laughter says, um, any way you could show us the cover art of the book you're reading from? It looks like there are a couple of different editions and I want to get the right one. Well, I'm actually just reading um, from my browser this time. There are lots of different editions of this because it's been published many times. And uh, indeed now it's in the public domain. So you can find it actually for free on, um, on Gutenberg 
or um i mean you can all of the editions are um i think the text is the same so i would say just go for uh go for whichever one has the coolest um the coolest cover that's what i always do <laughs> right here we go A few weeks after, when the moon of May was at the full, Vicar and Squire met again in the park and walked to the hall together. Lady Fell was with her mother, who was dangerously ill, and Sir Matthew was alone at home, so the vicar, Mr Crome, was easily persuaded to take a late supper at the hall. Sir Matthew was not very good company this evening. The talk ran chiefly on family and parish matters, and, as luck would have it, Sir Matthew made a memorandum in writing of certain wishes or intentions of his regarding his estates, which afterwards proved exceedingly useful. When Mr Crome thought of starting for home about half past nine o'clock, Sir Matthew and he took a preliminary turn on the gravelled walk at the back of the house. The only incident that struck Mr Crome was this. They were in sight of the ash tree which I described as growing near the windows of the building. When Sir Matthew stopped and said, what is that that runs up and down the stem of the ash? It is never a squirrel. They will be all in their nests by now. The vicar looked and saw the moving creature, but he could make nothing of its colour in the moonlight. The sharp outline, however, seen for an instant, was impressed on his brain, and he could have sworn, he said, though it sounded foolish, that squirrel or not it had more than four legs. Still, not much was to be made of the momentary vision, and the two men parted. They may have met since then, but it was not for a score of years. Next day Sir Matthew Fell was not downstairs at six in the morning as was his custom, nor at seven, nor yet at eight. Hereupon the servants went and knocked at his chamber door. I need not prolong the description of their anxious listenings and renewed batterings on the panel. The door was opened at last from the outside, and they found their master dead and black. So much you have guessed. That there were any marks of violence did not at the moment appear, but the window was open. One of the men went to fetch the parson, and then by his directions rode on to give notice to the coroner. Mr Crome himself went as quick as he might to the hall, and was shown to the room where the dead man lay. He has left some notes among his papers, which show how genuine a respect and sorrow was felt for Sir Matthew. And there is also this passage, which I transcribe for the sake of the light it throws upon the course of events and also upon the common beliefs of the time. There was not any the least trace of an entrance having been forced to the chamber, but the casement stood open, as my poor friend would always have it in this season. He had his evening drink of small ale in a silver vessel of about a pint measure, and tonight had not drunk it out. The drink was examined by the physician from Bury, a Mr Hodgkins, who could not, however, as he afterwards declared upon his oath before the coroner's quest, discover that any matter of a venomous kind was present in it. For, as was natural in the great swelling and blackness of the corpse, there was much talk made among the neighbours of poison. The body was very much disordered as it lay in the bed, being twisted after so extreme a sort as gave too probable conjecture that my worthy friend and patron had expired in great pain and agony. And what is as yet unexplained, and to myself the argument of some horrid and artful design in the perpetrators of this barbarous murder, was this, that the women which were entrusted with the laying out of the corpse and washing it, being both sad parsons and very well respected in their mournful profession, came to me in a great pain and distress both of mind and body, saying what was indeed confirmed upon the first view, that they had no sooner touched the breast of the corpse with their naked hands, than they were sensible of a more than ordinary violent smart and aching in their palms, which, with their whole forearms, in no long time swelled so immoderately, the pain still continuing, that, as afterwards proved during many weeks, they were forced to lay by the exercise of their calling, and yet no mark seen on the skin. Upon hearing this I sent for the physician, who was still in the house, and we made as careful a proof as we were able by the help of a small magnifying lens of crystal, of the condition of the skin on this part of the body, but could not detect with the instrument we had any matter of importance beyond a couple of small punctures or pricks, which we then concluded were the spots by which the poison might be introduced, remembering that ring of Pope Borgia with other known specimens of the horrid art of the Italian poisoners of the last age. 
so much is to be said of the symptoms seen on the corpse. As to what I am to add, it is merely my own experiment, and to be left to posterity to judge whether there be anything of value therein. There was on the table by the bedside a Bible of the small size, in which my friend, punctual as in matters of less moment, so in this more weighty one, used nightly, and upon his first rising, to read a set portion. And I taking it up, not without a tear, duly paid to him, which from the study of this poorer adumbration was now passed to the contemplation of its great original. It came into my thoughts, as at such moments of helplessness we are prone to catch at any the least glimmer that makes promise of light, to make trial of that old and by many accounted superstitious practice of drawing the sorts, of which a principal instance in the case of his late sacred majesty, the blessed martyr King Charles, and my lord Falkland, was now much talked of. I must needs admit that by my trial not much assistance was afforded me, yet as the cause and origin of these dreadful events may hereafter be searched out, I set down the results in the case it may be found that they pointed the true quarter of the mischief to a quicker intelligence than my own. I made then three trials, opening the book and placing my finger upon certain words, which gave in the first these words from Luke 13, 7, cut it down, in the second, Isaiah 13, 20, it shall never be inhabited, and upon the third experiment, Job 39, 30, her young ones also suck up blood. That is all that need be quoted from Mr. Crome's papers. Sir Matthew Fell was duly coffined and laid into the earth, and his funeral sermon, preached by Mr. Crome on the following Sunday, had been printed under the title of The Unsearchable Way or England's Danger and the Malicious Dealings of Antichrist, it being the vicar's view, as well as that most commonly held in the neighbourhood, that the squire was the victim of a rescrudence of the popish plot. Let's take a little break there. So, Matthew Fell is dead. Um, and we don't know what killed him, but there was a lot wrong with the corpse. Okay, there's uh, there's something that I want to um, talk about here, uh, and that is the notes that the vicar made about the accounted superstitious practice of drawing the sorts, because I did not know what that is. Um, credit to you if you have heard of that and did know. It was a new one on me. Um, drawing the sorts um, was basically a fortune-telling method whereby you opened a Bible at a random page and put your finger at a random point, more or less, and sort of trusted to God, I suppose, that whatever line you were um, that you landed on had some significance. So that's what uh, the vicar was doing there, was basically taking, um, uh, taking the dead man's Bible and just opening it at three different points and finding the lines cut it down it shall never be inhabited and her young ones also suck up blood there you go gentleman drill says that's a horrible way to go yep 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 yep, yep. denise l says just a cute little poisonous squirrel that's fine and normal Angela Sanchez says, religion roulette, like all the best scientists of the day. There you go. Well, I think we should move on. We've had our first death. Our web giant says, the vicar was doing bibliomancy, the modern term for it. I haven't heard that term. There you go. <clears throat> His son, Sir Matthew II, succeeded to the title and estates, and so ends the first act of the Castringham tragedy. It is to be mentioned, though, the fact is not surprising that the new baronet did not occupy the room in which his father had died, nor indeed was it slept in by anyone but an occasional visitor during the whole of his occupation. He died in 1735, and I do not find that anything particular marked his reign, save a curiously constant mortality among his cattle and livestock in general, which showed a tendency to increase slightly as time went on. 
Those who are interested in the details will find a statistical account in a letter to the Gentleman's Magazine of 1772, which draws the facts from the baronet's own papers. He put an end to it at last by a very simple expedient, that of shutting up all his beasts in sheds at night, and keeping no sheep in his park, for he had noticed that nothing was ever attacked that spent the night indoors. After that, the disorder confined itself to wild birds and beasts of chase, but as we have no good account of the symptoms, and as all night watching was quite unproductive of any clue, I do not dwell on what the Suffolk farmers called the Castringham Sickness. The second Sir Matthew died in 1735, as I said, and was duly succeeded by his son, Sir Richard. It was in his time that the great family pew was built out on the north side of the parish church. So large were the squire's ideas that several of the graves on that unhallowed side of the building had to be disturbed to satisfy his requirements. Among them was that of Mrs. Mothersole, the position of which was accurately known thanks to a note on a plan of the church and yard, both by both made by Mr. Crome. A certain amount of interest was excited in the village when it was known that the famous witch, who was still remembered by a few, was to be exhumed. And the feeling of surprise, and indeed disquiet, was very strong when it was found that, though her coffin was fairly sound and unbroken, there was no trace whatever inside it of body, bones, or dust. Indeed, it is a curious phenomenon, for at the time of her burying, no such things were dreamt of as resurrection men, and it is difficult to conceive any rational motive for stealing a body otherwise than for the uses of the dissecting room. The incident revived for a time all the stories of witch trials and of the exploits of the witches, dormant for forty years, and Sir Richard's orders that the coffin should be burnt were thought by a good many to be rather foolhardy, though they were duly carried out. Sir Richard was a pestilent innovator, it is certain. Before his time, the hall had been a fine block of the mellowest red brick, but Sir Richard had travelled in Italy and become infected with the Italian taste, and having more money than his predecessors, he determined to leave an Italian palace where he had found an English house. So Stucco and Ashlar masked the brick, some indifferent Roman marbles were planted about in the entrance hall and gardens, a reproduction of the Sibyl's Temple at Tivoli was erected on the opposite bank of the mere, and Castringham took on an entirely new, and I must say a less engaging, aspect. But it was much admired and served as a model to a good many of the neighbouring gentry in after years. One morning, it was in 1754, Sir Richard woke after a night of discomfort. It had been windy and his chimney had smoked persistently, and yet it was so cold that he must keep up a fire. Also, something had so rattled about the window that no man could get a moment's peace. Further, there was the prospect of several guests of position arriving in the course of the day, who would expect sport of some kind and the inroads of the distemper, which continued among his game, had been lately so serious that he was afraid for his reputation as a game preserver. But what really touched him most nearly was the other matter of his sleepless night, he could certainly not sleep in that room again. That was the chief subject of his meditations at breakfast, and after it he began a sy systematic examination of the rooms to see which would suit his notions best. It was long before he found one. This had a window with an eastern aspect, and that with a northern. This door the servants would be always passing, and he did not like the bedstead in that. No, he must have a room with a western lookout so that the sun would not wake him early, and it must be out of the way of the business of the house. The housekeeper was at the end of her resources. Well, Sir Richard, she said, you know there is but one room like that in the house. Which may that be? said Sir Richard. And that is St Matthew's, Sir Matthew's, the West Chamber. Well, put me in there, for there are light a night, said her master. Which way is it? I oh, here to be sure, and he hurried off. Oh, Sir Richard, but no one has slept there these forty years. The air has hardly been changed since Sir Matthew died there. Thus she spoke and rustled after him. Come, open the door, Mrs Chittick. I'll see the chamber at least. So it was opened, and indeed the smell was very close and earthy. Sir Richard crossed to the window and impatiently, as was his wont, threw the shutters back and flung open the casement. For this end of the house was one which the alterations had barely touched, grown up as it was with the great ash tree, and being otherwise concealed from view. Air it, Mrs. Chiddock, all today, and move my bed furniture in the afternoon. 
Put the Bishop of Kilmore in my old room. Pray, Sir Richard, said a new voice, breaking in on this speech. Might I have the favour of a moment's interview? Sir Richard turned round and saw a man in black in the doorway, who bowed. I must ask your indulgence for this intrusion, Sir Richard. You will perhaps hardly remember me. My name is William Crome, and my grandfather was vicar in your grandfather's time. Well, sir, said Sir Richard, the name of Crome is always a passport to Castringham. I am glad to renew a friendship of two generations. Standing in what can I serve you? For your hour of calling, and, if I do not mistake you, your bearing, shows you to be in some haste. That is no more than the truth, sir. I am riding from Norwich to Bury St Edmunds, with what haste I can make, and I have called in on my way to leave with you some papers which we have but just come upon in looking over what my grandfather left at his death. It is thought you may find some matters of family interest in them. You are mighty obliging, Mr Crome, and if you will be so good as to follow me to the parlour and drink a glass of wine, we will take a first look at these same papers together. And you, Mrs Craddock, as I said, be about airing this chamber. Yes, it is here my grandfather died. Yes, the tree perhaps does make the place a little dampish. No, I do not wish to listen to any more. Make no difficulties, I beg. You have your orders. Go. Will you follow me, sir? They went to the study. The packet with which young Mr Crome had bought, he was then just become a fellow of Clare Hall in Cambridge, I may say, and subsequently bought out a respectable edition, a respectable even, edition of Polyanus, contained among other things the notes which he, the old vicar had made upon the occasion of Sir Matthew Fell's death. And for the first time, Sir Richard was confronted with the enigmatical sorts biblicae, which you have heard. They amused him a good deal. Well, he said, my grandfather's Bible gave one prudent piece of advice. Cut it down. If that stands for the ash tree, he may rest assured. I shall not neglect it. Such a nest of catars and agues was never seen. The parlour contained the family books, which, pending the arrival of a collection which Sir Richard had made in Italy, and the building of a proper room to receive them, were not many in number. Sir Richard looked up from the paper to the bookcase. I wonder, says he, whether the old prophet is there yet. I fancy I see him. Crossing the room, he took out a dumpy Bible, which, sure enough, bore on the flyleaf the inscription, to Matthew Fell, from his loving godmother, Anne Aldous, 2nd September, 1659. It would be no bad plan to test him again, Mr Crome. I will wager we get a couple of names in the chronicles. Hmm, what have we here? Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. Well, well, your grandfather would have made a fine omen of that. No more profits for me, they are all in a tale. Uh, and now, Mr Crome, I am infinitely obliged to you for your packet. You will, I fear, be impatient to get on. Pray allow me another glass. So, with offers of hospitality, which were genuinely meant, for Sir Richard thought well of the young man's address and manner, they parted. In the afternoon came the guests, the Bishop of Kilmore, Lady Mary Harvey, Sir William Kentfield, etc. Dinner at five, wine, cards, supper, and dispersal to bed. Next morning, Sir Richard is disinclined to take his gun with the rest, he talks with the Bishop of Kilmore. This prelate, unlike a good many of the Irish bishops of his day, had visited his see and indeed resided there for some considerable time. This morning, as the two were walking along the terrace and talking over the alterations and improvements in the house, the bishop said, pointing to the window of the West Room, You could never get one of my Irish flock to occupy that room, Sir Richard. Why is that, my lord? It is in fact my own. Well, our Irish peasantry will always have it that it brings the worst of luck to sleep near an ash tree, and you have a fine growth of ash not two yards from your chamber window. Perhaps, the bishop went on with a smile, it has given you a touch of its quality already, for you do not seem, if I may say it, so much the fresher for your night's rest as your friends would like to see you. That is something else, it is true. Cost me my sleep from twelve to four, my lord. But the tree is to come down tomorrow, so I shall not hear much more from it. I applaud your determination. It can hardly be wholesome to have the air you breathe strained as it were through all that leafage. Your lordship is right there, I think. But I had not my window open last night. It was rather the noise that went on. No doubt from the twigs sweeping the glass that kept me open-eyed. I think that can hardly be, Sir Richard. Here, you see it from this point. None of these nearest branches even can touch your casement unless there were a gale. And there was none of that last night. They missed the panes by a foot. 
No, sir, true. What then will it be, I wonder, that scratched and rustled so? I uncovered the dust on my sill with lines and marks. At last they agreed that the rats must have come up through the ivy. That was the bishop's idea, and Sir Richard jumped at it. So the day passed quietly, and night came, and the party dispersed to their rooms, and wished Sir Richard a better night. I think we'd better take a little break there. And, um, check in with the chat. Meffy to go says, and there we have the significance of the ash. Danny McNamara says, get rid of the murder tree. Safe plan. Demetrio Prokit, uh, Prokitsky, sorry if I mangled the pronunciation there, says, cutting down the tree. Seems like a good idea. Dally Daydream says, yeah, rats. Haunted rats. Yeah, no one's really buying the rat theory. Gentleman Drill says, should have stayed in his old room. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nimble Tack says, for some reason it's scarier when someone else is reading it. Well, thank you. All right. Seems like everyone's digging the story so far. I feel like we're ramping up towards something. I think we should keep going. Angela Sanchez says, immense hubris on the part of this bishop. Jolie Lewison says, denial is a strong and foolish thing. Claire T says the tree's going to go all Fangorn Forest on him. Gavin M says digging the story and also digging up graves. Yeah, that's what uh, Sir Richard is all about. Okay. Phil Tyler says ash trees in the olden times were believed to be a portal back from the dead. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Here we go. So the day passed quietly and night came and the party dispersed to their rooms and wished Sir Richard a better night. And now we are in his bedroom with the light out and the squire in bed. The room is over the kitchen and the night outside still and warm so the window stands open. There is very little light about the bedstead but there is a strange movement there. It seems as if Sir Richard were moving his head rapidly to and fro with only the slightest possible sound. And now you would guess, so deceptive is the half-darkness, that he had several heads, round and brownish, which moved back and forward even as low as his chest. It is a horrible illusion. Is it nothing more? There. Something drops off the bed with a soft plump like a kitten and is out of the window in a flash. Another... Four, and after that there is quiet again. Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. As with Sir Matthew, so with Sir Richard. Dead and black in his bed. A pale and silent party of guests and servants gathered under the window when the news was known. Italian poisoners, popish emissaries, infected air, all these and more guesses were hazarded, and the Bishop of Kilmore looked at the tree in the fork of whose lower boughs a white tomcat was crouching, looking down the hollow which years had gnawed in the trunk. It was watching something inside the tree with great interest. Suddenly it got up and craned over the hole. Then a bit of the edge on which it stood gave way and it went slithering in. Everyone looked up at the noise of the fall. Well, it is known to most of us that a cat can cry, but few of us have heard, I hope, such a yell as came out of the trunk of that great ash. Two or three screams there were, the witnesses are not sure which, and then a slight and muffled noise of some commotion or struggling was all that came. But Lady Mary Harvey fainted outright and the housekeeper stopped her ears and fled till she fell on the terrace. The Bishop of Kilmore and Sir William Kentfield stayed, yet even they were daunted, though it was only at the cry of a cat, and Sir William swallowed once or twice before he could say... There is something more than we know of in that tree, my lord. I am for an instant search. 
and this was agreed upon. A ladder was brought, and one of the gardeners went up, and looking down the hollow, could detect nothing but a few dim indications of something moving. They got a lantern, and let it down by a rope. We must get at the bottom of this, my life upon it, my lord, but the secret of these terrible deaths is there. Up went the gardener again with the lantern, and let it down the hole cautiously. They saw the yellow light upon his face as he bent over, and saw his face struck with an incredulous terror and loathing, before he cried out in a dreadful voice and fell back from the ladder, where happily he was caught by two of the men, letting the lantern fall inside the tree. He was in a dead faint, and it was some time before any word could be got from him. But by then they had something else to look at. The lantern must have broken at the bottom, and the light in it caught upon dry leaves and rubbish that lay there for a few minutes. For in a few minutes a dense smoke began to come up, and then flame, and to be short, the tree was in a blaze. The bystanders made a ring at some yard's distance, and Sir William and the bishop sent men to get what weapons and tools they could find, for clearly whatever might be using the tree as its lair would be forced out by the fire. So it was. First at the fork they saw a round body covered with fire, the size of a man's head, appear very suddenly, then seem to collapse and fall back. This five or six times, then a similar ball leapt into the air and fell on the grass, where after a moment it lay still. The bishop went as near as he dared to it and saw... What but the remains of an enormous spider, venous and seared, and as the fire burned lower down, more terrible bodies like this began to break out from the trunk, and it was seen that they were covered with greyish hair. All that day the ash burned, and until it fell to pieces the men stood about it, and from time to time killed the brutes as they darted out. At last there was a long interval when none appeared, and they cautiously closed in and examined the roots of the tree. They found, says the Bishop of Kilmore, below it a rounded hollow place in the earth wherein were two or three bodies of these creatures that had plainly been smothered by the smoke. And what is to me more curious, at the side of this den, against the wall, was crouching the anatomy or skeleton of a human being, with the skin dried upon the bones, having some remains of black hair, which was pronounced by those that examined it to be undoubtedly the body of a woman and clearly dead for a period of 50 years. And that is the end. Wow. So I have the chat in the corner of my eye on my monitor next to the story. And at the point where, um, at the point where things started bursting out of the tree on fire, I just saw the chat. Uh, nope, 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 nope. Mary Hall says, no. The voice of Todd says, dead cat. Nope, nope, nope. Rebecca M says, oh no, the poor cat. Oh no, poor kitty, says Jolie Lewison. Clarity says, the tree ate the cat. Katie Douglas, R.I.P. Kitty. Santosh Borgi, no, kitty. Kitty, no, says stop the bees. Yep, the tree ate the cat. So, turned out, the tree was full of spiders. Hopefully, um, hopefully Ellen hasn't tuned in for this. So, what did we think of that story? Um, let's talk about it. Let me know what you thought. Um, it is only 8.48, so I'm inclined to read another of these short stories. Let me know if you would be up for that or not. We don't have to. We could always save it. We could always save it. But if uh, if anyone's up for another one, yeah, let me know what you thought of that. I thought it was really creepy. Um, not so much. Uh, there wasn't really a ghost in it per se. Not like last week's story. It was a much creepier sort of um, sort of story. I thought more uh, demonic, more demonic than ghosty and if you know what i'm if you know what i mean does that make sense katie douglas says it was definitely spooky very good yes please for another emma rose says please read another john burnham always up for more stories 
Cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Carl Be Back says, what another marvellous reading, Luke. Really enjoyed this. Definitely a special treat on my birthday. Carl Be Back, happy birthday. Regnad Zoom says, it was more of a slow burn. Mmm, Orangeful uh, hits the nail on the head, I think, when they describe it as a witch's revenge story. That's right. Well, I suppose she was a witch. I mean, at the beginning, we were we were sort of questioning, like, was it was was he right to give that evidence to to get her killed as a witch? But I guess I I mean, I guess she was doing I guess she was up to something. But yeah, cool, right? Cool story. Horrible. The way they're described. He, spider sp spider bodies the size of heads. I think the detail that when I read this made me like a bit was the uh, was the like description that they're all covered in like grayish hair. Oh, horrible. Uh, thank you for um, thank you for sending the um, the super chat, Critsbury. Well, the um, yeah, the sticker. I like the sticker. It's the emoticon of the like the eye, you know, the the emoji that's just like eyes and no mouth. Which is kind of how I feel after reading that story. Hmm. Ah, now some interesting discussion in the chat as to um, as to uh, as to whether it was a revenge story. Swooping as bad says, "Which or not, they did her dirty." Yep. Yeah, I, you know what? I think you're right there. <laughs> uh, Secreta Jensen says, support your local witch. And Kelsey Schoenbaum says, that witch was certainly playing the long con, though. Yeah, I mean, very long, like 50 years long. Alex Samara says, remind me, what was the thing she was saying as she went to her execution? Yeah, that would be interesting to read now, now that we know what happens in the end. So when the witch was put to death, she said something, didn't she? Um... All right, I'm just scrolling up and I'll let you know. She said... She said, there will be guests at the hall. I guess by guests, she meant her pet spiders. Stephen Robson says, what made you choose this story? Um, I read it, liked it. Fran Fry says, I just made a retching noise. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, there will be guests at the hall. Kimberly Isaac says, how did the spiders get her body in the tree? Yeah, I, d I guess we don't know exactly how the body ended up in the tree. I suppose we have to assume that that was, you know, magic. Magic. Danny McNamara says, did she mean to say ghosts? when she uh, there will be ghosts at the hall yeah maybe i mean yeah maybe her last words were um maybe she just misspoke uh i'm going to slightly adjust my microphone um uh, for this next story actually no you know what i will do instead of that i'll adjust my chair just to come down slightly slightly more comfortable week week there we go all right shall we read another one So, um, why don't we do another one from this collection? Uh, here's another one that I've read. Canon Alberic's Scrapbook. Canon Alberic's Scrapbook. Yes. Here we go. Will there be more spiders, says Shy Violet. That would be telling. <clears throat> a bit more water. Rebecca M says, ah, this one I've read. Canon Alberic scrapbook. St. Bertrand de Comines. Comine? Comine? Stumbled onto pronunciation in the first sentence there. Let's go with Comine. St. Bertrand de Comines is a decayed town on the spurs of the Pyrenees, not very far from Toulouse. 
and still nearer to Bagnères de Luchon. It was the site of a bishopric until the Revolution, and has a cathedral, which is visited by a certain number of tourists. In the spring of 1883, an Englishman arrived at this old world place. I can hardly dignify it with the name of city, for uh, there are not a thousand inhabitants. He was a Cambridge man who had come specially from Toulouse to see St Bertrand's Church, and had left two friends, who were less keen archaeologists than himself, in their hotel at Toulouse, under promise to join him on the following morning. Half an hour at the church would satisfy them, and all three could then pursue their journey in the direction of Orc. But our Englishman had come early on the day in question, and proposed to himself to fill a notebook and to use several dozens of plates in the process of describing and photographing every corner of the wonderful church that dominates the little hill of Comines. In order to carry out this design satisfactorily, it was necessary to monopolise the verger of the church for the day. The verger, or sacristan, I, pr uh, sacristan. I prefer the latter appellation, inaccurate as it may be, was accordingly sent for by the somewhat brusque lady who keeps the inn of the Chapeau Rouge. When he came, the Englishman found him an unexpectedly interesting object of study. It was not in the personal appearance of the little, dry, wizened old man that the interest lay, for he was precisely like dozens of other church guardians in France, but in a curious, furtive, or rather hunted and oppressed air which he had. He was perpetually half glancing behind him. The muscles of his back and shoulders seemed to be hunched in a continual nervous contraction, as if he were expecting any moment to find himself in the clutch of an enemy. The Englishman hardly knew whether to put him down as a man haunted by a fixed delusion, or as one oppressed by a guilty conscience, or as an unbearably henpecked husband. The probabilities, when reckoned up, certainly pointed to the last idea. But still, the impression conveyed was that of a formidable persecutor, even then a termagant wife. However, the Englishman, let us call him Deniston, was soon too deep in his notebook and too busy with his camera to give more than an occasional glance to the sacristan. Whenever he did look at him, he found him at no great distance, either huddling himself back against the wall, or crouching in one of the gorgeous stalls. Deniston became rather fidgety after a time, mingled suspicions that he was keeping the old man from his déjeuner, that he was regarded as likely to make away with St Bertrand's ivory crozier, or with the dusty stuffed crocodile that hangs over the font began to torment him. "'Won't you go home?' he said at last. "'I'm quite well able to finish my notes alone. You can lock me in if you like. I shall want at least two hours more here, and it must be cold for you, isn't it?' "'Good heavens,' said the little man, whom the suggestion seemed to throw into a state of unaccountable terror. "'Such a thing cannot be thought of for a moment. Leave Monsieur alone in the church. No, no, two hours, three hours, all will be the same to me. I have breakfasted. I am not at all cold. With many thanks to Monsieur.' "'Very well, my little man,' quoth Deniston to himself. "'You have been warned, and you must take the consequences.' Before the expiration of the two hours, the stalls, the enormous dilapidated organ, the choir screen of Bishop Jean de Molion, the remnants of glass and tapestry, and the objects in the treasure chamber had been well and truly examined, Sacristan still keeping at Deniston's heels, and every now and then whipping round as if he'd been stung, when one or other of the strange noises that trouble a large empty building fell on his ear. Curious noises they were sometimes. Once... Deniston said to me. I could have sworn I heard a thin metallic voice laughing high up in the tower. I darted an inquiring glance at my sacristan. He was white to the lips. It is he. That is, it is no one. The door is locked, was all he said. And we looked at each other for a full minute. Another little incident puzzled Deniston a good deal. He was examining a large, dark picture that hangs behind the altar, one of a series illustrating the miracles of St. Bertrand. The composition of the picture is well nigh indecipherable, but there is a Latin legend below which runs thus. Qualiter S. Bertrandus liberavit hominem quem diabolus diavolabat strangulare, which translates to How St. Bertrand delivered a man whom the devil long sought to strangle. 
Deniston was turning to the sacristan with a smile and a jocular remark of some sort on his lips, but he was confounded to see the old man on his knees, gazing at the picture with the eye of a suppliant in agony, his hands tightly clasped and a rain of tears on his cheeks. Deniston naturally pretended to have noticed nothing, but the question would not go away from him. Why should a daub of this kind affect anyone so strongly? He seemed to himself to be getting some sort of clue to the reason to the reason of the strange look that had been puzzling him all the day. The man must be a monomaniac. But what was his monomania? Let's take a little break there. Um so that was interesting. Uh when I read this, I um had to look it up. The the term monomaniac um is a uh, Victorian um, uh, psychological term. I mean, as as good a psychology as I suppose there was in Victorian times, which was not very not very good. Um, monomania basically was an umbrella term, I think, to describe um, any mental illness that involves a fixation on one particular thing. So, and this is just from Wikipedia, but like that could include like uh, kleptomania, for example. Um, uh, anything i mean obviously victorian mental health was an absolute disaster i mean you know understanding of mental health and care about mental health but there you go an interesting term um further reading if you fancy it monomania just checking in the chat And Zonk says, crazy old Maurice. Yeah, that's a Beauty and the Beast reference that I appreciate. Candlelafter says, cool, we also get to learn new words. Uh, Secret uh, Jensen says, Victorian mental health care is the real horror. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dimitro uh, Prok Proknitsky says, if I know something from horror games, it's that Latin equals everything is very bad. Mm -hmm. Fran Fry says... <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, reading stories. I have trouble sleeping because of anxiety and these stories help distract my brain. So thank you. Oh, um, thanks, Fran, Fl uh, Fran Fry, for, for tuning in. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm glad it's helpful. <laughs> Stephen Robson says, appreciate the research into Victorian terms. Thanks. Well, just ones that I don't... Um, just terms that I that I don't get. And, you know, that was one was particularly interesting to me. The man must be a monomaniac, but what was his monomania? So what I suppose Deniston means by that is the man is obviously mentally ill, but what does his mental illness orbit around? There we go. Megan B says, quite impressive anyone could use these as a sleep aid, to be honest. Oh, there you go. There you go. Mr. Team Corvette in the chat, friend of the friend of a uh, friend of the channel. Um, Doctor Team Corvette just described Victorian mental health as a quote poop storm. Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's probably uh, yeah, that's probably the the neatest we're going to put it, isn't it? And Borgarom says, I think the thing that spooks Luke was to read all those French words. Yeah, I'm giving uh, I'm I'm doing my best in this one. I've um, yeah, I'm kind of doing my best to pronounce words as I get to them in the sentence. So um, apologies if I am mangling some pronunciations. I'm trying my best. Okay. It was nearly five o'clock. The short day was drawing in and the church began to fill with shadows while the curious noises, the muffled footfalls and distant talking voices that had been perceptible all day, seemed, no doubt because of the fading light and the consequently quickened sense of hearing, to become more frequent and insistent. The sacristan began for the first time to show signs of hurry and impatience. He heaved a sigh of relief when camera and notebook were finally packed up and stowed away, and hurriedly beckoned Deniston to the western door of the church under the tower. It was time to ring the Angelus. A few pulls at the reluctant rope and the great bell Bertrand, high in the tower, began to speak, and swung her voice up among the pines and down to the valleys, loud with mountain streams, calling the dwellers on those lonely hills 
to remember and repeat the salutation of the angel to her whom he called blessed among women. With that, a profound quiet seemed to fall for the first time that day upon the little town, and Deniston and the sacristan went out of the church. On the doorstop, they fell into conversation. Monsieur seemed to interest himself in the old choir books in the sacristy. Undoubtedly, I was going to ask you if there were a library in the town. Uh, no, Monsieur, perhaps there used to be one belonging to the chapter, but it is now such a small place. Here came a strange pause of irresolution, as it seemed. Then, with a sort of plunge, she went on, uh, But if Monsieur is a Monsieur de Verlivre, I have at home something that might interest him. It is not a hundred yards. All at once, Deniston's cherished dreams of finding priceless manuscripts in untrodden corners of France flashed up to die down again the next moment. It was probably a stupid missile of Plantin's printing, about 1580. Where was the likelihood that a place so near to lose would not have been ransacked long ago by collectors? However, it would be foolish to not go. He would repro reproach himself forever after if he refused. So they set off. On the way, the curious irresolution and sudden determination of the sacristan recurred to Deniston, and he wondered in a shame-faced way whether he was being decoyed into some pearl hole to be made away with as a supposed rich Englishman. He contrived, therefore, to begin talking with his guide and to drag in, in a rather clumsy fashion, the fact that he expected two friends to join him early the next morning. To his surprise, the announcement seemed to relieve the sacristan at once of some of the anxiety that oppressed him. "'That is well,' he said quite brightly. "'That is very well. Monsieur will travel in company with his friends. They will be always near him. It is a good thing to travel thus in company. Sometimes.' The last word appeared to be added as an afterthought, and to bring with it a relapse into gloom for the poor little man. They were soon at the house, which was one rather larger than its neighbours. Stone-built, with a shield carved over the door, the shield of Alberic de Molion, a collateral descendant, Deniston tells me, of Bishop Jean de Molion. This Alberic was a canon of Comines from 1680 to 1701. The upper windows of the mansion were boarded up, and the whole place bore, as does the rest of Comines, the aspect of decaying age. Arrived on his doorstep, the sacristan paused a moment. Perhaps, he said, perhaps after all, Monsieur has not the time. Not at all, lots of time. Nothing to do till tomorrow. Let us see what it is you've got. The door was opened at this point, and a face looked out, a face far younger than the sacristan's, but bearing something of the same distressing look. Only here it seemed to be the mark, not so much of fear for personal safety, as of acute anxiety on behalf of another. Plainly the owner of the face was the sacristan's daughter, and, but for the expression I have described, she was a handsome girl enough. She brightened up considerably on seeing her father accompanied by an able-bodied stranger. A few remarks passed between father and daughter, of which Deniston only caught these words said by the sacristan, he was laughing in the church. Words which were answered only by a look of terror from the girl. But in another minute they were in the sitting room of the house, a small high chamber with a stone floor, full of moving shadows cast by a wood fire that flickered on a great hearth. Something of the character of an oratory was imparted to it by a cr tall crucifix, which reached almost to the ceiling on one side. The figure was painted of the natural colours, the cross was black. Under this stood a chest of some age and solidity, and when a lamp had been brought and chairs set, the sacristan went to this chest and produced therefrom, with growing excitement and nervousness, as Deniston thought, a large book wrapped in a white cloth, on which cloth a cross was rudely embroidered in red thread. Even before the wrapping had been removed, Deniston began to be interested by the size and shape of the volume. Too large for a missal, he thought, and not the shape of an antiphona. Perhaps it may be something good after all. The next moment the book was open, and Deniston felt that he had at last lit upon something better than good. Before him lay a large folio, bound, perhaps late in the 17th century, 
with the arms of Canon Alberic de Molion stamped in gold on the sides. There may have been a hundred and fifty leaves of paper in the book, and on almost every one of them was fastened a leaf from an illuminated manuscript. Such a collection Deniston had hardly dreamed of in his wildest moments. Here were ten leaves from a copy of Genesis, illustrated with pictures which could not be later than AD 700. Further on was a complete set of pictures from a Psalter of English execution of the very finest kind that the 13th century could produce. And, perhaps best of all, there were twenty leaves of uncial writing in Latin, which, as a few words seen here and there told him at once, must belong to some very early, unknown, patristic treatise. Could it possibly be a fragment of the copy of Papias on the words of our Lord, which was known to have existed as late as the 12th century at Nimes? In any case, his mind was made up. That book must return to Cambridge with him, even if he had to draw the whole of his balance from the bank and stay at St Bertrand till the money came. He glanced up at the sacristan to see if his face yielded any hint that the book was for sale. The sacristan was pale and his lips were working. If Monsieur will turn on to the end, he said. So Monsieur turned on, meeting new treasures at every rise of a leaf, and at the end of the book he came upon two sheets of paper, of much more recent date than anything he had seen yet, which puzzled him considerably. They must be contemporary, he decided, with the unprincipled canon Alberic, who had doubtless plundered the chapter library of St Bertrand to form this priceless scrapbook. On the first of the paper sheets was a plan, carefully drawn and instantly recognisable by a person who knew the ground, of the south aisle and cloisters of St Bertrand's. There were curious signs looking like planetary symbols and a few Hebrew words in the corners, and in the northwest angle of the cloister was a cross drawn in gold paint. Below the plan were some lines of writing in Latin, which ran thus. Responsa, 12 December, 1694. Interrogatum est, inveniamne. Responsum est, invenies. Viamne dives, vies. Viamne invendus, vives. Moriana in lecto mio, ita. Which translated to Answers of the 12th of December, 1694. It was asked, shall I find it? Answer, thou shalt. Shall I become rich? Thou wilt. Shall I live an object of envy? Thou wilt. Shall I die in my bed? Thou wilt. A good specimen of the treasure hunter's record. Quite reminds me of one Mr. Minor Canon Quartermain in Old St. Paul's, was Deniston's comment, and he turned the leaf. What he then saw impressed him, as he has often told me, more than he could have conceived any drawing of pic or picture capable of impressing him. And though the drawing he saw is no longer in existence, there is a photograph of it, which I possess, which fully bears out that statement. The picture in question was a sepia drawing at the end of the 17th century, representing, one would say at first sight, a biblical scene. For the architecture, the picture represented an interior, and the figures had that semi-classical flavour about them which the artists of 200 years ago thought appropriate to illustrations of the Bible. On the right was a king on his throne, the throne elevated on twelve steps. A canopy overhead, soldiers on either side, evidently King Solomon. He was bending forward with outstretched scepter in attitude of command. His face expressed horror and disgust. Yet there was in it also the mark of imperious command and confident power. The left half of the picture was the strangest, however, the interest plainly centred there. On the pavement before the throne were grouped four soldiers, surrounding a crouching figure which must be described in a moment. A fifth soldier lay dead on the pavement, his neck distorted and his eyeballs starting from his head. The four surrounding guards were looking at the king, in their faces, the sentiment of horror was intensified. They seemed, in fact, only restrained from flight by their implicit trust in their master. All this terror was plainly excited by the being that crouched in their midst. 
I entirely despair of conveying by any words the impression which this figure makes upon anyone who looks at it. I recollect once showing the photograph of the drawing to a lecturer on morphology, a person of, I was going to say, abnormally sane and unimaginative habits of mind. He absolutely refused to be alone for the rest of that evening, and he told me afterwards that for many nights he had not dared to put out the light before going to sleep. However, the main traits of the figure I can at least indicate. At first you saw only a mass of coarse, matted black hair. Presently it was seen that this covered a body of fearful thinness, almost a skeleton, but with the muscles standing out like wires. The hands were of a dusky pallor, covered like the body with long, coarse hairs and hideously taloned. The eyes, touched in with a burning yellow, had intensely black pupils and were fixed upon the throned king with a look of beast-like hate. Imagine one of the awful bird-catching spiders of South America translated into human form and endowed with intelligence just less than human and you will have some faint conception of the terror inspired by the appalling effigy. One remark is universally made by those to whom I have shown the picture. It was drawn from the life. As soon as the first shock of his irresistible fright had subsided, Deniston stole a look at his host. The sacristan's hands were pressed upon his eyes. His daughter, looking up at the cross on the wall, was telling her beads feverishly. At last the question was asked, Is this book for sale? Let's take a break there. And uh, Petrovic says, spiders, of course. Laura Dealey, oh no, spiders have returned. Jan Stenholt, spiders again. Holland Marie, and there's the spiders. Marie Hull says, spider skellies. Jenny Munchkin, no more spiders. Drew Drew says, good to know spiders were considered scary back then too. Dally Daydream says, who sees that picture and wants to buy it? Sacre bleu, that painting sounds terrible, says Gentleman Drill. Alex Samara says, bird-eating spider in human form. Wow. Mm. Kelsey Schoenbaum, it belongs in a museum. And Jolie Lewison says, whoever edited this book had severe arachnophobia. Mm -hmm. yeah so here's my question to the chat if you found this book would you try to buy it i feel like if it was me i would not however however what's interesting about it is that Obviously, Deniston is a collector, right? He's looking for rare artifacts. He's looking for folios exactly like this. Apart from the last page, which is night nightmarish, you know, it's there's some super valuable uh, stuff in stuff in here. Uh, like, uh, you know, this is a this is a this is a reputation making artifact, and yeah, it's got a clearly haunted horrible drawing on the last page but you know there's um i i think deniston is thinking about all the other pages at this point maddie lal says tear out the last page and then buy it hmm i just get the feeling that tearing out the page might be a bad move for your general aliveness in the future in felix soros says get a priest to exercise the damn thing first yep, 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 yep. and fabian eckert says i'd probably be way too curious not to buy it <laughs> denise l takes the opposite approach saying burn the whole place down just to be sure
<laughs> Elegant Egotist says, I want to see the picture. Yeah. I kind of want to see it. But also, like, I love that description of the picture. I feel like were I to see the picture, it wouldn't possibly be as creepy as it is in my imagination. Hmm. I suppose what it makes me think is like, you know, I'm not particularly interested in old manuscripts and illuminations, but like, what am I interested in? Like, what if I was, uh, Oh, Kobe Morris says there are versions on Google images warning. They're terrifying. Okay, well, open a new tab at your own risk. But Clumsy by Fact says it's worse when you imagine it, yeah. I'm trying. I'm just trying to think, like, what is there, like, I don't know. If there was, like, what do I buy? Musical instruments or something. If there was, like, a beautiful uh, accordion or, or, like, old classical guitar like something beautiful and they were like oh yeah but like just fyi there's like it the bag it comes in has a like terrible etching of a demon on it and it's clearly cursed i mean like well i do want the guitar i don't know i'm trying to put myself in dennis it seems so obvious to be like no close the book leave the house but mm, i suppose you have to imagine i suppose you have to imagine like Everything else in the book, you really want it. Okay. Folks, should we bring it home? That casual dragon says, what if it was a cursed dinosaur skeleton? Well, now there. There is the dilemma. Here we go. <clears throat> At last the question was asked, is this book for sale? There was the same hesitation, the same plunge of determination that he had noticed before. And then came the welcome answer. If Monsieur pleases. How much do you ask for it? I will take 250 francs. This was confounding. Even a collector's conscience is sometimes stirred, and Deniston's conscience was tenderer than a collector's. My good man, he said again and again, your book is worth far more than 250 francs, I assure you. Far more. But the answer did not vary. I will take 250 francs, not more. Well, there was really no possibility of refusing such a chance. The money was paid, the receipt signed, a glass of wine drunk over the transaction... And then the sacristan seemed to become a new man. He stood upright. He ceased to throw those suspicious glances behind him. He actually laughed, or tried to laugh. Deniston rose to go. I shall have the honour of accompanying Monsieur to his hotel, said the sacristan. Oh, no thanks. It isn't a hundred yards. I know the way perfectly, and there is a moon. The offer was pressed three or four times and refused as often. Then Monsieur will summon me if he if he finds occasion. He will keep the middle of the road. The sides are so rough. Certainly, certainly, said Deniston, who was impatient to examine his prize by himself. And he stepped out into the passage with his book under his arm. Here he was met by the daughter. She, it appeared, was anxious to do a little business on her own account. Perhaps, like Gehazi, to take somewhat from the foreigner whom her father had spared. A silver crucifix and chain for the neck. Monsieur would perhaps be good enough to accept it. Well, really, Deniston hadn't much use for these things. What did Mademoiselle want for it? Nothing, nothing in the world. Monsieur is more than welcome to it. The tone in which this and much more was said was unmistakably genuine, so that Deniston was reduced to profuse thanks and submitted to have the chain put round his neck. It really seemed as if he had rendered the father and daughter some service which they hardly knew how to repay. As he set off with his book, they stood at the door looking after him, and they were still looking when he waved them a last good night from the steps of the Chapeau Rouge. Dinner was over, 
and Deniston was in his bedroom, shut up alone with his acquisition. The landlady had manifested a particular interest in him since he had told her that he had paid a visit to the sacristan and bought an old book from him. He thought, too, that he had heard a hurried dialogue between her and the said sacristan in the passage outside the salle à manger, some words to the effect that Pierre and Bertrand would be sleeping in the house, had closed the conversation. All this time, a growing feeling of discomfort had been creeping over him. Nervous reaction, perhaps, after the delight of his discovery. Whatever it was, it resulted in a conviction that there was someone behind him, and that he was far more comfortable with his back to the wall. All this, of course, weighed light in the balance as against the obvious value of the collection he had acquired. And now, as I said, he was alone in his bedroom, taking stock of Canon Alberic's treasures, in which every moment revealed something more charming. Bless Canon Alberic, said Deniston, who had an inveterate habit of talking to himself. I wonder where he is now, dear me. I wish that landlady would learn to laugh in a more cheering manner. It makes one feel as if there was someone dead in the house. Half a pipe more, did you say? I think perhaps you are right. I wonder what that crucifix is that the young woman insisted on giving me. Last century, I suppose. Yes, probably. It's rather a nuisance of a thing to have round one's neck. Just too heavy. Most likely her father has been wearing it for years. I think I might give it a clean-up before I put it away. He had taken the crucifix off and laid it on the table. When his attention was caught by an object lying on the red cloth just by his left elbow. Two or three ideas of what it might be flitted through his brain with their own incalculable quickness. A pen wiper? No, no such thing in the house. A rat? Too black. A large spider? I trust to goodness not. No. Good God. A hand like the hand in that picture. In another infinitesimal flash he had taken it in, Pale, dusky skin, covering nothing but bones and tendons of appalling strength. Coarse black hairs, longer than ever, grew on a human hand. Nails rising from the ends of the fingers and curving sharply down and forward. Grey, horny and wrinkled. He flew out of his chair with deadly, inconceivable terror clutching at his heart. The shape, whose left hand rested on the table, was rising to a standing posture behind his seat. His right hand crooked above his scalp. There was a black and tattered drapery about it. The coarse hair covered it as in the drawing. The lower jaw was thin. What can I call it? Shallow, like a beast's. Teeth showed behind the black lips. There was no nose. The eyes of a fiery yellow against which the pupil showed black and intense, and the exulting hate and thirst to destroy life which shone there were the most horrifying features in the whole vision. There was intelligence of a kind in them, Intelligence beyond that of a beast, below that of a man. The feelings which this horror stirred in Deniston were the intensest physical fear and the most profound mental loathing. What did he do? What could he do? He has never been quite certain what words he said, but he knows that he spoke, that he grasped blindly at the silver crucifix, that he was conscious of a movement towards him on the part of the demon and that he screamed with the voice of an animal in hideous pain. Pierre and Bertrand, the two sturdy little serving men who rushed in, saw nothing but felt themselves thrust aside by something that passed out between them and found Deniston in a swoon. They sat up with him that night, and his two friends were still at St Bertrand by nine o'clock next morning. He himself, though still shaken and nervous, was almost himself by that time, and his story found credence with them, though not until they had seen the drawing and talked with the sacristan. Almost at dawn, the little man had come to the inn on some pretense and had listened with the deepest interest to the story retailed by the landlady. He showed no surprise. It is he, it is he, I have seen him myself, was his only comment, and to all questionings, but one reply was vouchsafed. Deux fois, je l'ai vu, mille fois, je l'ai senti. He would tell them nothing of the provenance of the book, nor any details of his experience. I shall soon sleep, and my rest will be sweet. Why should you trouble me? he said. 
He died that summer. His daughter married and settled at St. Papoul. She never understood the circumstances of her father's obsession. We shall never know what he or Canon Alberic de Molion suffered. At the back of that fateful drawing were some lines of writing which may be supposed to throw light on the situation. Contradicto Salomonis cum demonio nocturno, Albericus de Molion delianavit, ver dies in auditorium, pies qui habitat. Which translates to the dispute of Solomon with a demon of the night, drawn by Alberic de Molion. O Lord, make haste to help me. Saint Bertrand, who put us devils to flight, pray for me most unhappy. I saw it first on the night of December 12, 1694. Soon I shall see it for the last time. I have sinned and suffered, and have more to suffer yet. December 29th, 1701. The Gallia Christiana gives the date of the canon's death as December 31st, 1701, in bed of a sudden seizure. Details of this kind are not common in the great work of the Samatani. I have never quite understood what was Deniston's view of the events I have narrated. He quoted to me once a text from Ecclesiasticus. Some spirits there be that are created for vengeance, and in their fury lay on sore strokes. On another, on another occasion he said... Isaiah was a very sensible man. Doesn't he say something about night monsters living in the ruins of Babylon? These things are rather beyond us at present. Another confidence of his impressed me rather, and I sympathised with it. We had been, last year, to Comines to see Canon Alberic's tomb. It is a great marble erection with an effigy of the canon in a large wig and soutane, and an elaborate eulogy of his learning below. I saw Deniston talking for some time with the vicar of St. Bertrand's, and as we drove away he said to me, I hope it isn't wrong, you know I am a Presbyterian, but I, I believe there will be saying of mass and singing of dirges for Albrecht de Moulion's rest. Then he added, with a touch of the northern British in his tone, I had no notion they came so dear. The book is in the Wentworth Collection at Cambridge. The drawing was photographed and then burnt by Deniston on the day when he left Comines on the occasion of his first visit. And that is the end of that story. There you go. What did we make of that? He survived. He lived. Holland Mary says, and it's the Babadook. Opal Laybourne says, oh, no, 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 uh-huh, sorry, but nope, I'm out, peace be with you. <laughs> Catastrophe Moth says, this is why you don't buy cursed artefacts. And Angel Beat says, sounds very bloodborne indeed. Yeah. Angela Sanchez says, and now it's loose. It is loose. Kelsey Schoenbaum says, what's French for told you so? Good question. Kaiser of Darklight says, I was playing Resident Evil 7 for the first time when the jump scare happened as you described the creature. I jumped so hard I almost flung my cat that was resting on my lap as I fell out my chair. Good job, my man. Good job to you, Kaiser of Darklight. That is some bravery, playing Resident Evil 7 while listening to horror stories. <laughs> oh my god. That sounds like... Hmm... Uh, people trying to translate the bit of French, the bit of French even, sorry, that the uh, sacristan says. Uh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go back to it. Deux fois je l'ai vu, mille fois je l'ai senti. Uh, which uh, Rob C translates, and this seems accurate, so does Kobe Morris. Uh, Two times I've seen it, a thousand times I've felt it. So I suppose we are to believe that the sacristan um was seriously haunted by the drawing for quite a long time over a period of time and in that time he saw the demon twice but felt it a thousand times which is horrible mm. man that's unpleasant 
Canned laughter says, oh, hell no, don't look up that drawing. You know I'm going to have to look it up. Carl be back says, first, thank you, Luke, and the chat for the birthday wishes. I appreciate it. Second, I applaud your pronunciation of both the French and Latin words. Clap, clap, clap. Well, um, I don't know how accurate it was, but uh, give it a go. Um, so what I like about this story is that the structure uh, sort of wrong-footed me, I think, a little, in that... Uh, it kind of reaches its sort of frightening climax. And then there's another few minutes afterwards, which are, which are you know, sort of like a, like a kind of coda to the story, which, you know, you, you have Deniston, who's the one who bought the haunted book, you know, alive and well and seemingly unhaunted, though, you know, a little freaked out, obviously, for the rest of his life by what he saw. But he lives. Um, which I like, but I think just like the detail that you get at the end about, you know, going to the tomb, about the dates, the translation under the sketch, I think it's sort of, the first time I read it, I was like, oh, it feels like it's a bit of an anticlimactic ending because it's, you know, it's just a load of like detail and dates and Latin and it's not very frightening. You've sort of had the frightening bit already, you, you know be cooler if it sort of ended on a frightening note but um you know having sat with it for a few days i now think that all of those details kind of make it feel just that bit more plausible that bit more real and i think they mean that it's harder to sort of dismiss and put out of your mind as a ghost story which obviously it is um but you know it's those details and the ending that just make it feel like there's something about the there's something about the way that it doesn't end in like total catastrophe. It doesn't end in a sort of haunted demon bloodbath where everyone is killed. It's just a sort of, you just get the imp impression that it's a, it's like a, it's like a nasty brush with the, with the occult, you know, with something nasty. So yeah, I like it. I like that. I like that the. I like that the actual action when it comes, is sort of understated. Rogue Monitor says it stews. That's nice. That's nice. That's a nice way of putting it. Shy Violet says, "What if the demon made that book just to make friends? What if it was lonely?" Let's go with that. Let's go with that. Canned Laughter says, "Okay, Luke, I'm going to go read a happy story about puffins and puppies so I can get that thing out of my head." Uh, Paul Harry says, your Latin and French is excellent, Luke. Appreciate the compliment. I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Web Giant says, weird, the Wikipedia drawing makes the monster look way shorter than I imagined. And Kelsey Schoenenbaum says, I feel bad for the sacristan. Yeah, I feel bad for the sacristan because, like, I feel like the sacristan obviously wanted to get rid of this book and when he did get rid of the book that ended the curse for him um but probably didn't out of a sense of obligation to not pass it on uh and and get someone else cursed um mm. <laughs> But maybe ultimately it just became too much and then someone, you know, wandered into his life who was just really, really into, uh, you know, old books. And, uh, and you know, maybe was just maybe at the point where Deniston comes along, the sacristan's like, you know what? He wants the book. If this English, if this English idiot wants the book so bad, he can have it. I think that explains also the sort of the reluctance. Oh, Nimbletack makes a good point. Uh, I guess that he wanted to avoid the curse getting passed on to his daughter. Oh, yeah, I suppose so. If she had inherited the book, I suppose, yeah, the lesser of two evils might have been passing it on. Um, hmm. Web Giant says, The demon was bound to the drawing, not the book. And Denison photographed the drawing and then burned the drawing. Yeah. I like the idea that just 
like you can still have the drawing but it's a photograph and the photograph's not haunted so it's fine although uh it, it is mentioned isn't it that um that the author shows the uh the photograph to some people and they all have trouble sleeping afterwards mm. fight nerd says just what i need to stay awake to study not gonna sleep after that story Katarina says, I'm sorry, Luke, but I couldn't hear the rest. It was way too creepy for me. I prefer stories like the previous ones with spiders <laughs> and spiders, lol. <laughs> yeah, okay. So here's what I um, here's what I want to know. Anyone who has been on the stream long enough to hear both stories. Uh, which did you prefer? Did you prefer the ash tree or did you prefer uh, the story we just read, uh, which is called Canon Alberic's Scrapbook? which is a pretty uh, fitting title, I think, because it is about Canon Alberic's scrapbook. Um, yeah, let me know which one you preferred. While you're, um, while you're letting me know, I'm going to... I'm going to look up a picture of the demon. Oh, no, 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 no. Ooh, wow. Yep, that's a, that's a hard pass. And close tab. <laughs> okay, everyone's saying what they preferred. Okay, cool. Hmm. Secret Emerald says, Ash Tree, me thinks. Swooping is bad, says, I prefer the scrapbook because it was scarier. The second one, by far, I like the second story more, way more creepy. Um... I think I preferred the ash tree, but still liking last week's The Old Nurse's Tale the best, says Dally Daydream. Hmm. Well, you know what? I'm a little surprised. I really thought that, um, I thought that, you, I thought that everyone would prefer the ash tree. But. Yeah, Web Giant says ash tree. Lots of people involved with lines. Yeah, I like the ones with, I like the ones with dialogue. Um. Not a lot of these scary stories are pretty dialogue light because they tend to be sort of told from the point of view of one terrified writer. Um, Denise L says the second one had less spiders in it. Less, but not none. Emma Allison says demons are my thing. Gaijin Gamer says I like scrapbook. I love the creepiness of it. Juju says Albert because I sort of zoned out on the first one due to work. Can't Stop the Beast says they were both spooky and good. I like Deniston because he has sense as a horror protagonist, but I like the old-timey ash tree spookiness. Mm. Canon Scrapbook says Lucas Petrie. Uh, ash tree was lovely, but had less immediate terror until the burning of the tree. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, Joyce, Plan uh, Joyce Plantinger says ash tree thought it was more interesting. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Orange of All says, Ash Tree was better writing, but I feel like Scrapbook was scarier. Okay, and last question. Um, I think I know the answer, but like, did we enjoy this author? Because um, M.R. James has written a lot of scary short stories. A whole bunch of them are in front of me right now. And I thought, I thought they were pretty good. I would like to come back and maybe read a couple of these. Um, a couple more. Yep, yeah, all right. Yep, yeah. okay. <laughs> cool. Oh, I, I, one thing I, I've one thing I forgot to mention is that the bit that the bit that really creeped me out in um, Canon Albrecht's scrapbook is just the is is the, the description and it, like it's a bit of a cliche. Like it's not on. I, it, it, by this point, it's not something that I've heard for the first time. But just the point where um, he sat reading the book and it's described that he just has this sensation that there's something behind him. There's just something so primal and creepy about feeling like there's something behind you. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Cool. All right. Everyone is keen on the author. That's great because I really enjoyed these two. So we will come back to this. We will come back to this. Um, oh, my goodness. I mean, there's so many. There's so many. I'll read some more. I'll read some more this week. 
Nimble Tack says these stories make my back itch. Yep. Agreement on the creepiness of feeling something behind you. Katie Collins says, great work, Luke. Thanks, Katie. Friend of the channel, Katie Collins. Unimaginative username says, Luke, there's something behind you. Hey, the only thing that's behind me is a real fireplace. A real for definite fireplace. Hmm. Kelsey Schoenbaum says, a thousand times I felt it. Yeah, that French translation was creepy. Hmm. Ah, Laura Dealey says, question for you, Luke. Did you enjoy it more or less reading the story beforehand? Um, I liked... I liked not reading the story beforehand because I felt like I was more with the chat in terms of the developments of the story. On the other hand, on the other hand, I think I preferred having read it first just because I felt like I had a better sense of where to put the breaks in, um, you know, like where to pause. I knew that I, I know where I can pause and it's not going to like, and now let's return to the story and there's only one line left or something. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, just, you know, some of the writing, uh, some of these sentences are so long and with, with vocabulary that is just not in use anymore. So it really helps for me to already know what point a particular paragraph is trying to convey and then I can try and like lean into that a little bit in the delivery don't know how successful but it helps cool Jan Stenholt says now I'm looking for things in the shadows behind Luke I think we're good I think we're good all right would listen to more MR James, says Paul Harris. Well, there were... Oh, um, Kelsey Schoenenbaum says, did you practice the Latin or French? No, I did not. Probably I should have. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This was a great time. Again, uh, if you enjoyed this, then please consider subscribing to the channel. And... Uh, I will, yeah, we will, we will see you next time. We'll be back for more, more spooky stories. Um, because this is fun. Can Laughter says we need to get Luke a fluffy Victorian era shirt for him to wear while reading these. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, it's got to happen. I want to, I want to be dressed like full Ace Attorney Edgeworth get up by the end. Um, Cool. All right. Well, thanks very much uh, for watching. Hope everyone out there is is staying uh, healthy and staying as happy as they are able. Um, I'm so glad that you enjoyed this. Uh, David Badalotti. Oh, thank you for thank you for donating. Says thanks, Luke. Much appreciated. Uh, yeah. Take care, folks. Have a great week. Um. And yeah. Stay unhaunted. Remain unhaunted would be my advice. Cool. All right. Take it easy, folks. See you next time. Bye.